Um, so now I'd like to introduce Georgie Cohen. She's our very own Director of Digital Strategy here at OHO Interactive. Georgie has spent nearly 20 years wrangling digital content for universities and other organizations. As Director of Digital Strategy, Georgie partners with clients to create sustainable and impactful approaches to engaging website users and achieving organizational goals. Georgie has worked in or with higher ed since 2004, including a stint at Tufts University and Suffolk, Suffolk University and her own independent consultancy to higher education. She speaks frequently at industry conferences and events. Her talk is called Be True to Your, Pre Be True to your School, How to Keep Your Brand Fresh and Relevant. Um, Georgie, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to you. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> So I'm going to go ahead, share my screen here. Now, when I was thinking about this talk, uh, I thought that the title Be True to Your School would be really appropriate because um, that's what we're always trying to do with our brand, right? Is be true to, be true to who we are. And that's, I got that uh, title from a Beach Boys song. And I'm a huge music nerd. If I wasn't working uh, in, in marketing and content strategy, I would probably be a music journalist somewhere. I have a lot of clips. Uh, to my name in that regard. And now that, that's really sort of like my other love. So huge music nerd, um, huge Beach Boys fan. And as I started thinking about this talk, I got more and more caught up in the Beach Boys and not just because I was procrastinating putting the talk together. Um, I began to realize that the Beach Boys themselves were actually a really good kind of analogy for, for what I want to talk about today. Because you think about the Beach Boys, and if I say Beach Boys, you instantly had an image like this in your head, perhaps. You have those songs going through your head. Um, and there's really a definitive brand, I think, uh, to the Beach Boys, some, some hallmarks of their music. Um, harmonies, certainly, those stellar harmonies that they exhibit in almost every song. The song craft, so the actual musicianship, the songwriting, um, the, the incredibly complex, this deceptively complex song craft that they employ. Um, and then also the beach vibe. So, you know, again, like California Girls, Surfing USA, that you think about Beach Boys, it's not just in the name of the band, but the songs themselves, the thematic matter of the songs. Uh, it's all about California, surfing, the ocean, all that. So like, I feel like almost every Beach Boys song really ties back to, to these qualities, this brand, if you will, pretty, pretty closely. And you think about the brand and uh, any brand is really propelled by your mission and your vision. And for the Beach Boys, that was Brian Wilson, um, incredible musical genius, troubled guy. He uh, you know, had a tough upbringing, you know, the, the pressure of fame and sort of his own challenges with drug use and, and, and mental illness and whatnot. But through it all, he had this, this strong sense, this strong musical vision that really, whether the rest of his bandmates wanted it or not, really sort of pulled the band through, um, through their era. And you think about the Beach Boys and those brand attributes that I talked about. And from 1962, Surf and Safari, and there you go. And 1971, Surf's Up, even just the album covers, very different. But those albums reflect those same core brand attributes. It's just that the expression of those has evolved over time. If you look at the songs, uh, you listen to them, um, there's certainly an evolution in the, in, in the qualities, but those, those same core elements hold true. Even, even the titles of the albums, even though they're very different albums, covers are very different, Surf and Safari and, and Surf's Up, right? And you're also, your, your competition can kind of push and challenge your brand along the way as you go. So you think about 1965, so the Beatles released Rubber Soul, so a hugely definitive album of the time. Brian Wilson heard Rubber Soul, and he was like, I have to top it. I'm so inspired. This is incredible. I'm, I need to make an even better album. So the Beatles and the, the, the Beach Boys had this kind of healthy competition, or maybe, maybe unhealthy in Brian Wilson's regard, competition going. So and this challenge that Brian Wilson felt from Rubber Soul kind of helped inspire Pet Sounds, which has been hailed as one of the most definitive um, pop albums of, of all time. Uh, and then the Beatles heard Pet Sounds and they said, well, that's amazing. Now we're gonna release Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band. So all three of these albums 
you know, anyone would, you know, not be uh, criticized for putting them in a, a top 50 albums of the 20th century list, right? Uh, they're all stellar. They're all just incredible standout uh, rock albums, uh, hugely inspirational, hugely influential. But there's this sort of narrative, this push and pull that, that, they, that these bands had um, to sort of inspire each other, uh, push each other along the way. So what I want to talk about today is, is three different topics. One is what is a brand? What does that mean? Why and how does a brand change? And then how do you evolve a brand across your digital platforms? So let's begin by talking about what is a brand, those good vibrations that you put out there, right? Oh, OK, so what I got it. I got it all figured out. What is a brand? So what a brand really is, is, is the perceptions or associations that people have about an organization, in this case, your institution. And this can align with what you're putting out there. People can be picking up what you're putting down or not. It can be their own ideas and own impressions that they're getting from, from other sources as well. So a brand is foundational. It's really sort of, again, those, those core attributes and qualities of who you are. It's lived. It's something that should be and, and often is reflected in um, you know, what, what, what students are doing, how faculty are teaching. Sometimes when we're working with a school, they have no defined, no documented brand guidelines, nothing on paper, but you just walk onto campus and you're like, there it is, right? I, I see this person, I see this happening, I see this event, and that's the brand, right? And then you're like, great, like we had to figure out how to sort of, you know, put this in a bottle. It can be tactical. So there might be different aspects of your brand that are, are sort of relevant um, that you sort of like, you know, turn uh, and face those sides out in certain contexts. Uh, it can be costly. Um, certainly uh, the, the work, we'll talk a little bit about that, that goes into sort of uh, defining that brand and sort of having that articulation of it can, can be substantial. And it can be defined, or as I said, undefined. It can be current or it can be out of date. It can be activated or it can be dormant and it can, it can be documented or undocumented. So I believe we have a poll question right now to put out there for y'all. So do you have a defined institutional brand? Uh, we'll give people a few seconds just to share uh, their status there. Getting a bunch of questions, a bunch of, bunch of answers in. I guess I can end, I have the power to end the poll. Uh, so <laughs> I have the power. So about a little more than half of you say, yes, it's current and activated, but almost a third say it's outdated or not well activated. Uh, and, and that's not uncommon where you might have uh, sort of like a, a big brand deliverable, big work that you commission. And then it's kind of difficult to figure out how to sort of activate that into sort of day-to-day -day content creation and, and, and activity. Um, and, or it could be something that, you know, things might've changed and you kind of have definition that's, that's from the past. So, um, you know, that, that kind of jives, I think, with, with what we're often, often seeing. So you want higher ed and I consider higher ed to be mission driven and brand focused. So, so what do I mean by that? Let's talk about what mission and brand are. Mission is who you are. It's your identity. It's what drives you. Why, why do you get up and do what you do every day? That's the mission that's sort of pulling you forward. The brand is how you express your identity and your motivations and also how they're perceived. So why the mission matters as part of that uh, exercise, it focuses the work. It's going to help as you're thinking about that brand expression, it really helps focus around those core ideas of who you are and why you do what you do. So guiding those areas of emphasis. It helps define impact and success. If a mission is meant to be accomplished, right? Uh, so be able to, being able to understand the brand impact is, is closely aligned to, well, are we, are we achieving our mission? Are we living that out? It also shapes the internal culture. So uh, the, the, you know, how does the brand live when no one is looking? Um, you know, the, one of the things I always think of is, you know, when you go to school, if you see someone looking at a map, they're trying to figure out where to go. It's like, does a staff member go up and sort of say, hey, can I help you? That's the brand being lit when no one is looking, right? Uh, we're helpful, we're supportive, we, we want to take you where you want to go. Um, you know, that, that kind of a metaphor. So the mission helps shape that internal culture. So how and why does a brand change? So your brand is alive and it's going to grow and change, uh, at least the expression of it will. So you look at the Beach Boys across, across uh, you know, not too long, maybe like a decade or so between these photos, 
same band, um, a lot had changed, not just in how they look, but a lot of the personal dynamics, a lot of the things that they were going through as individuals, a lot of what was happening in the world around them. Uh, you know, there's been a, a lot of change uh, that, that happened in that interim. Uh, so how do we like sort of take advantage of this nimbleness? So Brian Wilson, again, when he was working on Pet Sounds, um, you know, the other bandmates weren't really into it. It was just a little too complicated, a little too advanced, uh, they called it. They kind of wanted to keep making surf songs and songs about cars and kind of feel good music. But Brian told the guys, we've got to grow. We've got to grow musically. So they had their brand. But they wanted to, Brian Milson, we wanted to like, you know, pull that forward and say, we want to evolve and grow how we are expressing that. Uh, and part of that is the influence of the times. That's really, and again, the competition, those factors that are sort of um, fueling how he is fulfilling his mission, his musical vision uh, through the Beach Boys. So there is the brand refresh, uh, the idea that you have a sense of who you are, but it's really worth revisiting uh, every now and again to sort of check in uh, and see is, is what we are set up to, how we communicate, what we're putting out there, how we're positioning ourselves, is that still relevant? So what, what might prompt an exercise like this? Uh, it could be an evolution of your institutional mission. Uh, you know, a mission is not something that you know, once you're founded in, in 1839, it's never going to change, right? Um, you know, there's probably a core of it that remains the same, but there could be new um, elements of it, new emphases, um, you know, new commitments that you make as an institution as you grow, um, as things change, as you sort of add new offerings, as you, you know, target new markets, that mission can evolve as well. You could have a shift in priorities, and that could be determined by a strategic plan uh, or other factors, uh, shifts in the market perhaps. Uh, you have new program offerings or other shifts in academic focus uh, if you're focusing more on health sciences, if you're focusing more on business, if you're focusing more um, on, you know, on online programming, things like that, um, you know, that might prompt revisiting how that brand is being expressed. You could have new audience segments that you're targeting again, versus if you've been sort of focused on a traditional market, now you're looking to maybe recruit more international students or get more students for these online programs, uh, that might sort of uh, prompt uh, rethinking, uh, revisiting how you're expressing that brand. You also think about the themes that are relevant in the marketplace. So that could be, uh, for instance, nowadays, you know, social justice themes, I think, are really uh, prevalent. Uh, we, we talk about uh, Generation Z a lot, but they're a very uh, socially engaged generation. Um, you know, they've been sort of brought up, very attuned to current events, very attuned to, uh, you know, things that are happening in the news and have a strong sense of, of justice, uh, environmental justice, sustainability. Uh, these are things that, you know, you talk to a, a class in the 80s or the 90s might not have been as prevalent, but uh, for this generation, it's, it's, it's a strong consideration. Or, you know, perhaps influenced by uh, the change, uh, sort of advances in technology and change in the employment market, STEM uh, has STEM offerings and, and having those kinds of programs um, are, are more relevant in the marketplace now. So what is about your brand and, and how you exemplify it is relevant to these themes? And, and how do you uh, really communicate these qualities? So I have this album here, uh, Summer Days and Summer Nights. Um, again, it's got uh, some of those, you know, classic Beach Boys themes. We're on the ocean, we're having a good time. California Girls was on this album. But what's kind of happening in the background is this was a beginning uh, of some of Brian Wilson's more uh, musical innovation. So again, you look at the cover, the title, it feels very fun. But some of that musical complexity that he was really beginning to pursue in earnest is creeping into that album. So thinking about achieving a more nimble brand, and it's, it's the more you have a, a stronger sense and more definition around the core of who you are, it's then actually easier to sort of then extend from that. Um, it's really, it's, you think about like know, it, knowing yourself, it's easier to sort of go out and try new things and flex when you have a strong sense of yourself, right? Just as a person. And the same is true for, for, for a brand. So think about Good Vibrations, um, 1966, classic song, we all know it has all the hallmarks of a classic Beach Boys song. But when you sort of look at it and sort of look at it at a closer level, 
it's often hailed as redefining pop song craft uh, in some of its complexity and some of the instrumentation, the songwriting. And it also really brought the band into the psychedelic era. So that's what's happening here in the mid to late 60s. You have psychedelic music emerging. Uh, you have uh, that really shaping Brian Wilson, shaping the band. There's different themes that they're talking about uh, that they're sort of reflecting on things like you know, meditation and transcendentalism and, and all these ideas. So it kind of sounds kind of fun and beachy, like you're going to have a barbecue on, on the beach, right? But there's a, there's a lot happening there. Um, so again, by knowing who you are and hold, you can hold fast to that, but still be able to respond and adapt to these emerging ideas or considerations that are influencing you as you go. And the market can change really quickly. Circumstances at your institution can evolve. So sometimes you might need to adapt quickly uh, to meet a need. Uh, and that's where being able to have a smaller brand evolution or kind of a brand pivot can help you do that to be able to respond to these emerging factors. So 1965, they released Beach Boys Party. Uh, and it kind of was the, the record label's like, hey, we need another album. I know you just released one a few months ago, but we want another one for the holiday season. We want to sell it at Christmas. And they were like, what can we do really quickly? So they kind of put together this kind of party album, uh, which had kind of an unplugged feel uh, and actually did a lot of cover songs. So that kind of approach, very, you know, unplugged albums, cover albums, we're very used to that uh, in the music market now. But at the time, it was actually very innovative uh, and not didn't take them too long to pull together. And it kind of bought time for Brian Wilson to keep on working and refining uh, Pet Sounds, which would really be his masterpiece. So even though they're kind of responding to this pressure, uh, responding to this need, they're still able to find ways to, to innovate there. Still classic Beach Boys, but being able to do something innovative in response to this need that emerged. So being a more nimble brand, uh, you know, when we think about branding efforts, it often feels like this sort of very this massive undertaking. Uh, it, again, we talk, like we said, it, it can be very expensive, it can be very time consuming, uh, very resource intensive, um, and you sort of get like a lot of material to work with. Um, but then it, it's kind of like, it can go fallow after that, especially if you don't really have an idea, like, well, what do I do with this, right? Like, how do I use this on a day-to-day -day basis? What stories do I write? How do I write this headline? What photos should I take? Uh, how do I really activate that? So, you know, sometimes you'll, have, you'll, you'll see an institution that sort of goes and makes that investment, but then there's not any sort of an ongoing like evolution of that. Uh, there's no sort of governance around it. And then maybe uh, some years later, they just do it again, right? And that's, that's really resource intensive. Whereas if you're sort of, you know, f finding ways to be nimble um, and sort of do that governance along the way, where you're able to sort of position yourself to respond to those emerging needs, um, that, that brand doesn't lie fallow. It's able to be responsive and relevant. Uh, when things are relevant, that's where you're engaging people and that's where you're, you're really capturing their interest. And Georgie, I think you wanted to ask a quick poll question there. I did. I'm gonna launch that for you. <laughs> All right, so if you have a defined institutional brand identity, how did you develop it? Did you work with a third party branding vendor or did you develop it in house? I was trying to think if there was like a, a third option, but I'd be curious in, if people put in the chat or some other uh, means of that, that they arrived at. So I'm gonna end the poll here. So almost two thirds of y'all worked with a third party branding vendor. Uh, and about a third, a little more than a third, 38% developed it in house. Um, so, you know, again, like that, it's great to have that defined and, you know, certainly, um, you know, different ways to do that. Um, but yeah, often, you know, you often see institutions sort of working with that external partner to, to get that work done. So, why aren't you advancing? Okay, I got it. How do you nimbly evolve a brand across your digital platform? So we've talked about the opportunity and why that might be a good idea. So how do we actually achieve this? So again, we're talking about those sort of like those brand undertakings. And this is true whether you're working with a third party vendor particularly, but it's also, you know, if you have the resources internally work that you can do uh, as well. 
um, those brand deliverables that you sort of the artifacts of that brand work, your pillars, your narrative, your messaging, positioning, personality attributes, it, it kind of varies what shape it takes depending on the process and the output. Uh, but it's usually some research that's involved in that. So uh, often you're surveying your community, doing sort of quantitative broad intake of perceptions and impressions. You're engaging key segments through interviews, focus groups, or workshops, really trying to dig into uh, people's attitudes, their preferences, their needs and behaviors. And then you're really digging in and analyzing the data, comparing across segments under, and really surfacing those notable findings. And you have that, that research that really gives you a depth understanding into your institution uh, and really give you a good foundation to understand how to uh, turn that into uh, a brand that can then be expressed and activated. So you look at something like this, and these are like your brand attributes, right? I call it sort of, it's like the raw material, the DNA. It's some, some collection of these adjectives, these words that then get sort of molded uh, into pillars and messages and narratives and positioning and these other sort of frameworks that give us a story to tell that really help define and shape who we are. Uh, it's kind of making sense of the chaos, right? Like this is you, it's this buzz of stuff that you are. Um, and some of these attributes sort of fade in and out of, of focus or prominence depending on the context, right? So often those, those brand artifacts, those, those deliverables are taking this raw stuff and putting it in a shape that really gives your brand a definition, gives it, gives it uh, some, some form and narrative uh, to sort of build off of. So what can this research also do? It can help us understand personas. So often when we're conducting user research, uh, we're developing personas for the different users. And that can, ha by having those in place, when you have a sense of who your audience is and understanding what they're trying to do, where they're coming from, what influences them, that can give you a little bit of context around how to uh, contextualize and present your brand uh, to different types of uh, individuals uh, as, you're, as you're sort of going through different communications processes. We also often develop customer journey maps. So as we're thinking about a certain process, a certain journey that a user is taking, whether it's sort of like a prospective student journey or something of that nature, what work does the brand have to do at different touch points to support that journey? There might be different aspects of your brand that you're wanting to show uh, to present to individuals at different points of the journey that are relevant to where they're at in that decision-making process or on that journey that they're taking. Um, what's gonna be relevant at that point to sort of help them uh, understand, to help them make a decision, to further motivate them along? Um, you know, it's not just sort of all, you know, all one thing at one time. Uh, it's, it's about knowing what to say when effectively. So how do you sort of build off of, of that brand research? So again, as you sort of have those personas and customer journey maps, revisiting them regularly to ensure that they're current uh, and plotting out the, re and the relevant and reinforcing brand touch points along the way. Um, you can gain brand content efficacy and gauge your brand content efficacy and impact and gain buy-in by regularly engaging those key audiences through focus groups, surveys, and user testing to assess relevance, accuracy, and effectiveness. So uh, again, as we sort of you know, develop, you know, here's uh, an idea of a view book or here's an idea of how we want to present the brand, talk to those people. Um, you have, you learn about your brand from them. So as you're sort of figuring out how to articulate the brand, show it back to them. Be like, did we get it right? Is this, is this working? Is this effective uh, in, in telling that story and being a vehicle for that narrative? Then you think about website analytics and really tying those to brand questions. So, um, you know, I feel like when we're talking about measuring the impact of a brand, certainly there's sort of brand surveys that you can do and, uh, you know, uh, brand awareness surveys, like, you know, do you have a sense that our school is this or that? Uh, web analytics and, and, and any kind of analytics around uh, you know, email, social, et cetera, any, any of those digital analytics can, can also help answer some of those questions because you're creating content uh, that is uh, reflecting the brand, right? So if you have stories, for instance, that are designed to reinforce certain brand pillars, are those resonating with users? Um, are, are they successful in engaging people? Um, and if they're not, how do you revise the storytelling approach uh, to, to be better aligned, right? Uh, and that's what data really can help us do. This kind of analytics data can help us say, great, we did this thing, did it work? 
yes or no. If it didn't, what can we do better next time? That's the sort of the flow that should be happening when you're looking at that data. Uh, and they can really connect those brand objectives to specific actions and conversions that you want people to take as you're thinking about and measuring the impact of the content that you're putting out there to be those brand vehicles and to be sort of, as I sometimes call it, the foot soldiers of your brand. But the weight of your brand ultimately lies in how it's perceived, not in how you express it. So, you know, what, what gold or platinum records have, have your brands earned lately, right? So, so my mouse doesn't work. So that means thinking about how we're gonna measure user behavior. So again, thinking about those analytics pieces, um, really tying that into a comprehensive measuring plan uh, where you're not just sort of looking at vanity metrics, but really digging in and saying, we have to be thinking about our business goals. We have to be thinking about our marketing goals and let those guide our approach and our framework for how we're actually uh, measuring uh, and assessing the effectiveness um, of our different content efforts, um, aligning that to a specific audience, uh, aligning those to actions, right? If we have content without action that it's trying to motivate or that it's supporting, uh, basically, what is the point of that content, right? Uh, and the brand, uh, as we're expressing it through that content, should be context that gives people a reason. Um, if it's if it's sort of resonating with them, that they're then going to sort of take that action or come to that understanding or sort of achieve the desired results that we have in mind there. So as we're thinking about, this is an example of kind of like a, a typical measurement framework that we're working through. Um, you know, having those those brand objectives in mind can can help focus this effort. So we're able to sort of get a more tangible understanding of how different content um, is really supporting our brand effectively. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the idea of just engaging your audience around these things. So as you have focus groups, if you have surveys, other ways that you're engaging folks um, with photography, um, with different brand um, efforts that you're putting out there to be able to understand like how are people uh, perceiving this? Uh, what's effective or not? What information is appealing? What information is not appealing? So if you're creating content with your brand in mind, which you should be, um, how effective is that content? Um, in actually achieving that. So the more that you can, and you know, having a focus group uh, in place, um, you know, it's, it can be hard and time consuming sometimes to get this kind of data, but you know, even if you're just able to sort of get a few people together and sort of have some printouts at a table uh, or even virtually on Zoom and just sort of show them information, just get those reactions. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a, a significantly time consuming endeavor, but the, anything that you can do to sort of get those in, get that in front of sort of that that relevant audience and say, you know, what is this doing? Have the questions in mind that you want answers to, uh, and and sort of get engage them in that way. So uh, it's just it's really valuable to sort of you know again they put they put input into the brand ideally through that that research. So um, you know bring it loop it back and, and and sort of present that material to them uh, in these ways. So as we're reflecting on digital brand expression, you think about some of the key digital brand entry points that you might be managing, your website, your social media, um, thinking about your, your search, so thinking about SEO. So there's a few key questions uh, that we might reflect upon. One is, do you have a clear sense internally of how to communicate your brand? So again, you know, do you have sort of like a high level sensitive brand, but it isn't really yet translated to style guides or content guidelines that you can reference? Are we elevating the right qualities of our program? So, um, you know, we, you don't want your, your programs are, you know, important uh, representations of your university, right? They're key contents that um, prospective students, whether it's undergraduate or graduate or, or other types of programs that they're looking for, that program information, um, you know, and that's a, a really interesting opportunity to be able to sort of surface uh, and align that to the brand. Because there's lots of accounting programs out there. There's lots of um, political science programs out there. But what is it about who you are and what motivates you uh, as an institution that shapes how you teach this program and what you offer students? Are you telling stories that engage people in an impact narrative uh, and motivate further engagement? So again, uh, as we're putting content out there, it, it, you're always putting a content out there to make an impact, uh, to guide uh, an impression, to uh, change, uh, to evoke a feeling, to prompt an action, right? Uh, content is designed to, uh, to guide an action. So uh, those stories, as we're sort of like reflecting our brand through them, uh, you know, are, are they motivating people? 
are you reflecting your community authentically and thereby providing a true window into your experience? We're often considering this question uh, in the context of uh, institutions who are thinking about their diversity, equity, equity and inclusion uh, goals and objectives. Uh, and it's often this, this kind of challenge or struggle that institutions have where uh, they, some institutions might be wanting to, uh, you know, achieve a more diverse community uh, or want to assert their inclusion, but it's, it's tricky stuff to communicate, right? Uh, and and some, some institutions don't really have a roadmap for how to do that. So I say that we've been working a lot uh, with different institutions and talking about these issues and figuring out how to strike that balance where you're not selling a false bill of goods, but you're kind of authentically representing who you are and, and but also being aspirational in that. Are you reducing transactional friction to allow for deeper brand immersion? Um, that could be as simple as, you know, how hard is it to navigate to that program page? It could be your site performance. If your site isn't loading quickly, <laughs> that's going to diminish your, your brand, the brand immersion because people may not wait around for a homepage that's taking 20 seconds to load, right? So there's lots of types of that transactional friction uh, that can transpire on a website that really would in, potentially inhibit that brand, all that, that brand content that you're working on, that, that language, the, the imagery, whatever it is. Uh, there's there's that a lot of opportunities that there could be uh, that would inhibit people from fully experiencing that. So we'll, you know that's something that we're always thinking about is how can we you know work to resolve those issues so that that content that impact can have a chance to really just be upfront and shine. And again, as we're talking about the sort of customer journey maps, the idea of like that brand being appropriately reinforced along the perceptive journey. So are different aspects of the brand being presented at the right time to sort of help people through that process. So when we're thinking about content strategy as sort of a way to activate the brand. Uh, there's kind of four different areas that we're considering. One is the topic. So what types of stories or information best reinforce these messages? Um, if you're uh, a communication shop where, uh, you know, kind of the, the historical way to operate has been people ask you to write things and you write them, that's not, a, a, that's not gonna really foster brand alignment and, and, and be in service of brand activation. Um, that's more just sort of being, uh, you know, re reactive to those needs that emerge. So, uh, you know, having that brand alignment means being more proactive and intentional uh, about the storytelling and, and, or the news or whatever it is, the information that you're putting out there to really whatever messages or pillars that you define for this is what we want to say about us and what we do and how we do it. Um, it means aligning that into your editorial process and the types of stories that you're telling uh, and being intentional about that. Then there's the style, voice, and tone. So how do you digitally convey your brand through language and visuals? Do you have guidelines around photography? Do you have voice and tone guidelines defined? You know, how can you take that sort of foundational brand work that you may have uh, and really, uh, you know, then uh, take it a step further into uh, more tactical guidance around language and syntax and voice and tone uh, as you go? Then there's format and content type. So you might say, we have these stories that are really going to be relevant or impactful, but what's the best format? Um, you know, do we have a lot of great statistics that help tell these stories that we want to present in compelling and accessible infographics? Um, do we have, is video the best format? Do we have video resources? Are photos the best format? Do we have photo resources? Um, can, we, can we tell the stories through testimonials, really center around uh, the individual's own authentic voice? There's lots of formats that you could pursue. One is not inherently better than the other just on its face. It's more about what's the best way to tell this story, but also what's the most sustainable way for us as an organization uh, to consistently uh, communicate uh, you know, these, these, these brand elements. Video might be great, but if you don't have video resources, that's gonna peter out really quick, right? Um, so you know, that's the, the balance to strike there. Then there's distribution, right? Um, you know, this is a field of dreams. Uh, we have to have a way to ensure that people can find it and also that we're pushing it out there. So, you know, are we teasing stories uh, in our, are we teasing our, uh, you know, cool stories on our website via Instagram stories? Are we optimizing uh, the structure of the content so that it can be found via search engines? You know, what is the way that we're enabling that content to be found and how are we also pushing it out there? Um, you know, is the right content going in the right email newsletter in the right format uh, so that the right audience is going to see it um, and it's going to help, you know, uh, 
facilitate alumni affinity back to the institution or get prospective students excited about applying or, or whatever it may be, right? So that distribution, I feel is often, it's a, you know, it's a piece where you have to sort of take that further step and not just say, I hit publish on the news story, everything's all good. How are you ensuring that people are gonna find it? How are you ensuring that you're putting it in front of the right audiences? So a message architecture is a way that if you don't have that sort of foundational brand work um, and you're, but you really need that sort of core set of messaging pillars to guide uh, how you communicate and what you're communicating, uh, it's a way to sort of define those messaging pillars at a high level and really create kind of a hierarchy of your communications goals of how you want people to be um, perceiving you and, and how you want, uh, you know, to be sort of uh, creating uh, those communications goals for your content. And that can generally inform uh, content you're creating. It can also help inform design a little bit as well. Uh, we're often creating these through a, a brand attribute card, card sorting exercise. It's actually uh, an exercise that was pioneered by uh, a content strategist named Margot Bloomstein. Um, so it, it allows you to sort of sort through brand attributes and, and sort of yield um, pillars uh, through this exercise. Uh, and it's an exercise that you, you can revisit um, you know, as, as you need to, to ensure that you're aligned around how you want to communicate about yourself. And I think that the, the key step is, all, is not just saying, great, here we are, but then it's activating that further and saying, how do you plug, the, let's plug these pillars into our editorial process that can really help focus decisions around the themes we want to be presenting, around taxonomy and other content priorities as well. So you think about your editorial calendar, uh, and it's not just saying, what am I doing Monday? What am I doing Tuesday? But what brand pillar is this reinforcing? Do am I achieving the right representation and balance of these different themes or pillars or, or, or you know personality attributes or whatever it may be over time? To ensure that we're having a balanced overall presentation of our brand, and that aligns to both written content, like a like a news story, but also visual content, the, the videos you're creating, right? So what is the balance of the brand that you want to present? Uh, on, on, on different channels and being intentional again, as I talked about earlier, about planning your content against that. So voice and tone is one of those tactical ways that you're sort of setting yourself up to be able to communicate in your brand voice and in your brand tone appropriately. The difference is that voice is who you are. It remains consistent. Um, it's not changing. You are who you are. That's sort of like that, that mission, right? It's like that heart. The tone is attitude. Uh, it changes with context. So a page about financial aid on your website might have a different tone than a page about clubs and activities or athletics or something like that, because you're trying to communicate different things. So it's like, you know, imagine like your parents, like your parents are your parents, but certainly they had different tones when there's, the, you know, whether you, you know, forgot to do a chore or they were sort of like saying, you know, saying happy birthday, right? The tone varies depending on the context there. Um, so determining how that tone can flex or respond to different brand needs is important so that you have to find that. Uh, and so, you know, one exercise that we'll go through is, is to say, well, okay, we're motivating or we're supportive, but like, how, okay, how do I write supportive? Like, I don't know how to do that. Especially if you are working with distributed content authors who may or may not have, a, uh, may not be full-time communication professionals, they need guidance. So give me examples of understanding how to write to that. Often we're writing sample copy, sort of good examples and bad examples so people know how and how not to write to the brand. And the role of visual design is to really uh, reinforce those key brand qualities, uh, interpret and extend those key brand elements. Um, you might, if you have sort of subordinate unit, you're kind of trying to sort of establish affiliation there. Uh, it can really help buoy your content strategy through interactions of visual appeal, help you stand out among peers and competitors, and of course, ensuring accessibility compliance and efficient site performance. Because again, that, that would be another, uh, aside from accessibility being just the right thing to do, that could be another sort of uh, source of friction there. I know that Tim talked a lot about sort of the, the, the process that he went through at Colgate, so I won't belabor this, but often having that creative concepting workshop uh, is a great way to sort of review your visual brand expression to ensure it's aligning both to digital best practices, such as accessibility, but it's also the most forward-facing representation of your, your visual brand identity. It's also helpful to regularly examine your site in the context of your peers and competitors so that you understand, again, think about the Beatles and the Beach Boys, understand the decisions that they're making, and then be able just to have that awareness and say, you know, does that, does that influence or, you know, how might that inform the decisions that we're making as well? Having that sort of um, awareness of the overall landscape is, is helpful, whether or not you act on it, just to be, have that awareness.
So design patterns can really reinforce the brand while creating a consistent visual language uh, uh, that really helps build confidence among users. If things feel consistent, it's, it's sort of this implicit way to sort of guide people through and give them reassurance uh, around the quality of your institution, but also just and how you're presenting information here. So this is some examples from sort of the, the design system that we developed for Bloomsburg University here. Um, you know, some of the, these uh, interact, uh, interactions uh, and sort of animated elements, uh, again, sort of having that alignment. This is an example from West Virginia University. So their component library, uh, urge you to sort of go and, and check this out. Um, they have all these elements defined. So if different web editors want to use different components to sort of pull them together to create different pages, all those elements are defined. They're brand aligned uh, visually um, and they're coded to best practice. So it's a really cool thing that, that West Virginia University has going, right? my pal Dave Olson over there. Uh, this is an example of a style guide that we created for the Naval War College. So again, just helping uh, the helping you understand what those colors are, some of the user interface elements, and it's documenting that uh, as part of that overall design system. And all those pieces are really tying back to brand governance. So once you define that brand identity, how do you ensure ongoing alignment? So Brand governance could take different shapes. It could be very centralized, where it's really tight control over the brand expression, tight control over all the publications that are happening, or it could be more decentralized, where you're sort of, uh, you know, there's either intentionally or just because there's not enough resources, the brand is kind of like lived and expressed across the institution. Everyone's sort of being able to have some, um, you know, leeway uh, in how they're expressing it. So. Ideally, to ensure the ongoing alignment, the more centralized you are, that generally means you need more resources if you want to be more centralized. You need to have more people to sort of, you know, create the graphics and write the content and, and manage the process and manage the platforms and have that those those that those human resources more centralized and that budget resource more centralized. If it's more decentralized, then it's really about training and guidelines. So. You're not, you're not relying, uh, not, you know, you're relying on other people, you're letting other people have a hand in creating some of those brand assets, those communications, those stories, but um, to ensure the alignment, it's really about equipping them with the knowledge and understanding of how to do that, how to do that in a way that's appropriate, that's aligned to the guidelines, having that be sort of part of the culture of the institution, that ongoing brand governance and really engaging people uh, in education around the brand. So, it's a lot to think about, but uh, you know, I think that uh, you know, I have confidence that there's a lot of ways to do this, uh, a lot of insight that you can gain uh, through uh, small and large ways to really help ensure ongoing brand alignment and being able to sort of pivot your brand and evolve it as these sort of uh, needs emerge. So hopefully I've shared some of those ideas today. And I wanna close with one of my favorite Beach Boys anecdotes that really speaks to that sense of, you know, things are gonna come up that uh, you didn't expect, but end up working out. Um, so again, Pet Sounds, which is a, really a favorite album of mine, one of the tracks on there is Caroline No. And this is Tony Asher was a collaborator with Brian Wilson. And when they're writing Caroline No, this is what Tony wrote. He said, when I sang the lyric for the first time to Brian, I was singing, oh, Carol, I know. I had in mind a song which a girl was trying to explain to the former lover the ine inevitability or maybe the unavoidability of growing up. Brian, understandably, heard it as Caroline No which struck me as a far more interesting line than the one I originally had in mind. And if you haven't heard that song, I urge you to go uh, check it out. Uh, but otherwise, I'm uh, excited to have shared these ideas with you here today and happy to take some questions. Awesome, thank you, Georgie. Um, we do have a couple of quick questions we'll try to get through here. Um, first one is from Tracy at the University of Southern Maine. <clears throat> Excuse me, she, she asks, um, how do you handle or manage the use of the full university name versus the school nickname? Our nickname is used so often it's far more recognizable than of our actual university name. I think that's probably a, a governance issue. So it's being, in I think being intentional about, and again, it's going to vary for every school depending on like how they feel about that. But, but in your case, I think it's, um, you know, if there's it's if there's entities out there who are using the nickname and you don't want them to, then it's a matter of like, well, how it, how proactive do you want to be in sort of policing that, right? Like, what is the governance around that? Obviously, if people are doing this and it's not desirable, it sounds like they, they just kind of can uh, and kind of do that. So I think it's it's about re rethinking the governance there and saying, you know, uh, what if people are going to be using uh, uh, the, uh, the name that we don't want them to use. Um, you know, is, is there, 
is that a guideline or is that a requirement for access to some platform? Like it's often kind of the carrot and stick stuff where you might be saying, if you're deciding that you want to police that to some degree, there has to be some kind of a consequence, right? And that's what we're often talking about in governance is accountability. Um, so how do you sort of hold your, if, if, if you're wanting to say, we want people to use our official name more, how do you hold people accountable to that? So is there some way that you can, um, you know, guide that through how you're, uh, you know, get, allowing access to certain systems or through certain resources that they have. It means it's educational. Maybe it's just a matter of, of outreach, individual outreach, um, before sort of like, you know, putting the hammer down to sort of engage people in that. Uh, it could be a matter of sometimes of just like, you know, being more intentional in, you know, putting that full name out there in other platforms so that it just kind of uh, the, the volume of that uh, pulls out. So I think that the governance piece is, is really key in the accountability. I, I'm sure that there's some institutions uh, represented uh, from the attendees here who have dealt with a similar type of challenge. So I'd be curious uh, if anyone else has something to share in the chat as a response uh, to Tracy, uh, some additional uh, guidance. I'm sure that would be helpful as well. And we have a loaded series of questions from our friend Lori at the University of Rochester. So she says, how did she, there's multiple questions here. So how do you activate a brand platform in your day to day, especially if you don't have a focused marketing office? If you're a digital, write, a digital designer, a writer, a photographer, a videographer, a content creator, how do you move toward creating content that supports a brand versus the content you've always created? Or how do you turn the content you've always always created into content that supports a brand? <laughs> I don't know if you could digest all that, but so let's start with if the, I correct you hearing that, it's like there's nothing, there's nothing defined, there's nothing documented, but you know there's a brand kind of walking around out there and you're wanting to create content in alignment to it. Is that did I process that right? And how to do that? Yeah, I can actually okay. unmute her if she wants to come on and <laughs> Chat for a second. <laughs> she says, am, yeah. I, am I unmuted? Yes. <laughs> You're unmuted. Oh, wow, cool. Um, that's me with the loaded questions. Now, I'm just wondering, like, we, we, for example, have done some brand work and we have some brand documentation, but then how do you, you basically answered the question, I think, Georgie, and the answer is see the entirety of my presentation that I just delivered. Um, but basically, like, how do you, how do you make that, um, how do you make that real in the work of someone who's like working in a news office or is the photographer or is the designer? How do you translate that or activate that into actual content that reflects this piece of brand work that has been delivered to you? Yeah, I think it's about building it into the decision-making process, whatever that is. So you take an editorial calendar, for example, let's say you have your brand, it's this big shiny PDF that, that came from wherever, um, if there's brand pillars there, let's say there's, like there's three or four of them or whatever, that becomes a new column in, in your spreadsheet for, you know, Instagram stories or whatever it is that we're making sure that we're, you know, how are we hitting those? You're making content decisions every day, right? Um, it could be as small as like, what photo do I put on the homepage today? What news story am I writing tomorrow? Um, or it could be bigger in terms of like, you know, what, what, what is the emphasis of our view book, right? So it's about making sure that 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 in some way, whether it's a small way, like a, like a toggle on a, a shell, a cell in a spreadsheet or in a bigger conversation, that it's it's part it's it's helping inform those decisions uh, that you're not making decisions in a vacuum outside of that because someone had a cool idea about whatever but you're finding a way to sort of integrate it and have it be a, a lever uh, that helps drive those decisions and then again think about the representation piece as well so uh, that I I think it's just about finding a way to integrate it and bring it into the conversation bring it into the decisions. Um, you know, pull it into uh, your decision making process, those editorial meetings, those calendars, where those things, where those things always happen. Um, you know, that, so it's, 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 it's helping inform that and that the conversation isn't like my idea versus your idea. It's more saying like, great, like we all have ideas, but here's, <laughs> here's what we're supposed to be communicating. What is an alignment with that? Maybe sometimes you know, we recommend an exercise of like, sort of like rating, like, Okay, that's a th on a scale of one to five, like that's a five in alignment with the brand. That's a three based on, you know, how that's set up. And it can sort of take a little bit of the emotion out of it if you're sort of like having you know, those priorities. But there's lots of ways to do that. But I think it's just finding a way to pull it into uh, the bigger, small, the decision making process around what do I publish next? <laughs> what photo do I take? What story do I make? You know, have that be part of the framework for making that call. 
That's great advice, great conversation. Thank you, Laurie, for those questions. Thank you, Georgie, for your presentation today. Ellen, unfortunately, we're out of time. We didn't have a chance to get to your questions, but I'll, we'll try to have uh, Georgie follow up with you directly um, about the question you just posted. Um, so I'm gonna invite Jason to come on here for a moment. Great, hi. So thank you everyone for attending today. And uh, just to follow up, I think on some of what Georgie was talking about, like I think if you find yourself in that spot where you're both either have a large brand project that you've been through, but figuring out like, how do we kind of, you know, digest this whole piece and activate that piece. Um, I think we've got sort of two approaches. One is sort of activating, you know, your brand through a content strategy plan and really trying to break that down and to make it something that's actionable for you to kind of walk through. So something that's sustainable for your team, you've got a roadmap, there's editorial templates. Um, that's one approach. Or, you know, if you're like Georgie said, you know, kind of more, how do you kind of stay kind of on that kind of constant flow of um, revising your brand and revising your messaging, not sort of just big bites every, you know, three to five to seven years. Um, I think we've got some other workshops that we can work with you on sort of to help define those, refine your messaging, um, kind of figure out how do we kind of freshen that up and or kind of bring in some new ideas or highlight some new elements of that. So if you feel like I have a new brand and I don't know how to digest it and get my team going and get the university going, we can help. Or if you're thinking, hey, I need some help. It's been a little while. We need to kind of refocus uh, what we're trying to do. We've got some workshop opportunities there too. So there's a link in the um, chat if those things are of interest to you. I would be glad to uh, have Georgie and some of the other folks on our team chat with you about um, how we could uh, help you all advance your brand and your messaging that way. So thank you so much for attending today.